Hey, turf management students, uh, since we didn't have class this week because of Labor Day, I'm recording a couple of uh, videos, uh, PowerPoints um, on this topic of turf species selection. Um, we'll, we'll do one of them on uh, cool season species and another one on warm season species. I wanted to divide it up because it's a, it's a, it's a large topic, it's an important topic. Uh, but it's not a terribly exciting topic to talk about. So um, something I'll do um, in ensuing weeks is when we meet on our Monday um, uh, lectures, um, I'll highlight one species, uh, maybe two, and uh, uh, talk about each one of them in a little bit more depth. So this will be a quick overview of uh, the more important turf grass species, just a few key points about each of them to uh, uh, introduce the topic. It's, it, again, it's an important one. It's one of these things in turf management that a lot of thought sometimes isn't given to. Um, but just like uh, every other plant in the landscape, the trees you plant, the perennials you plant, uh, the shrubs you plant, uh, it's important to put the right plant in the right place. This is also a very important topic uh, uh, for turf. So uh, we'll, uh, discuss each species uh, briefly, talk about some of the advantages, disadvantages of, of each one. Uh, an important thing to take away is that there is no perfect turf species for every situation, either in the Northern United States or the South. South. So uh, no perfect turf species, there's no magic bullet. Uh, they each have their own uh, benefits. They each have their own uh, potential problems. So that's an important thing to um, remember about species selection. One reason turf species selection is so important is that if you uh, put the wrong grass in a situation where perhaps it's not adapted due to shade um, or salty water, um, it's getting too much traffic. Um, if it's not the right fit for the situation in which it's been planted, um, you'll, you're always going to have problems um, with that turf, whether it's a home lawn or a uh, sports turf or a golf course green or a golf course fairway. Um, if the grass isn't the good fit, a, a better fit for that, those environments, uh, the amount of uh, activity it sees, the soil, the water, uh, you're, you're always going to be battling um, that grass to try to uh, optimize its quality. Uh, and and sometimes it doesn't matter how much money you throw at it, how much expertise you have. If it's not uh, a, a good grass for that situation, uh, you're never gonna uh, get optimal quality and performance out of that out of that grass. So it's it's one of this list of uh, as you see on the slide uh, reasons that we have problems with uh, with lawns and with uh, uh, turf in general is that. Uh, quite often, we're not managing that lawn properly. Um, this is why we're going to be uh, talking about each of these topics um, in class this semester, mowing, fertility, irrigation, uh, soil management. They're all important. Um, they don't, even though we talk about them individually, they don't um, exist on an island. They all interact with each other. Uh, so it's important to optimize all of those. Uh, but in the in the case of species, uh, you can do all those other practices correctly. And if it's a wrong fit, if it's a bad fit of that grass where you're trying to grow it, um, it doesn't matter really how well you perform all those other management practices. So, so this is an important uh, topic uh, when you do have the opportunity to uh, select a species uh, for a new landscape, whether it be a again, a home lawn or a park or a sports turf or a uh, golf course uh, situation, uh, take the opportunity to do your homework, uh, to analyze the situation, to find the best grass um, for that situation. And it's just gonna make future turf management, whether you're doing it or someone else is, uh, it's gonna make it easier uh, for that person. So what is the best grass to plant in a new lawn or maybe an old lawn that you're going to be renovating? Uh, 
Um, is it bluegrass or buffalo grass or Bermuda or St. Augustine grass? Uh, again, as I just mentioned, there is no perfect turf grass. It's really important to uh, understand that not all grasses will work equally well in a certain situation. So some are more shade tolerant, some are more traffic tolerant, some are more tolerant of, of uh, salty soil. Some do better at higher elevations than others. Um, so they all have these kind of places where they fit or where they're really a bad choice. So uh, some every few years, uh, uh, kind of a magic bullet grass appears to come along and it's heavily promoted. That used to be um, a turf type tall fescue, say 20, 30 years ago. Um, it was going to replace bluegrass. Well, it didn't. Then, then buffalo grass um, uh, became popular as a potential lawn species, and it was going to replace everything up and down the front range of Colorado. Well, it didn't. So even though new grass has come along, uh, quite often um, they underperform or actually they are over promoted um, and over promised and people try them in all these different situations and they don't do well. So uh, remember that uh, the perfect one hasn't been developed and I doubt the perfect grass will ever be developed uh, for every lawn situation. Now, something I want to point out, um, and this is particularly important for the uh, uh, design students, landscape architecture students who uh, uh, might be in the, in the course. And actually this points to the reason that uh, the turf management class is on the uh, landscape design in contracting uh, check sheet. Um, if you look at this um, drawing, and I'm not a judge of quality and all that type of thing. I'm not a design person, so I wouldn't know if this is a good a good design or not. Um, but something um, for many years and actually continues to strike me as uh, interesting, if you will, is uh, uh, it's 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 seen in this uh, uh, this slide uh, and you'll see it in the next one as well in that Every plant in the landscape has got a name. Every tree is labeled, all the shrubs are labeled, the perennials are labeled, the ground covers are labeled. But look what we have uh, in the lawn. It just says lawn. Um, and that kind of bothers me, not because I'm a turf person. Um, it bothers me because it shows that no thought or maybe very little thought is being given to what is going to be planted into that lawn. And just as you give a lot of thought to all those other plants in the landscape, uh, it's just as important to give a lot of thought and consideration to what you plant on that lawn. And when you look at the, the coverage, what percent of the landscape is that lawn? It's a pretty large percentage. And that lawn has to be mowed and watered and fertilized and pest management um, uh, must be done on that lawn. So whatever you put in that lawn, you want to make sure as, as much as possible that it's going to fit the needs of that client. It's going to fit the environment in which you're going to be planting that. Um, it's going to fit the uh, management desires of the client. So uh, give thought to what's going to be planted in that, in that uh, landscape's lawn just as much as you give thought to all those other uh, plants in the landscape. Uh, here's another example, just another drawing, um, you know, kind of different style, I guess, but they're on the right hand side. And I think it might be kind of hard to read, but a list of all of those plants and how many plants and all this type of thing. But look what they have for the lawn. It just says lawn. Um, so this, this bothered me, oh gosh, I've been here 32 years. So this is probably about 31 years ago. Um, a previous name, um, and it's, I'm, it's one I'm sure you don't know, uh, unless uh, Zach or Liz have mentioned his name in class, but a fellow named Grant Reed was leading the landscape uh, design uh, program at that time. And I was just a new young faculty member and I was looking at these drawings in the hallway in the Shepherdson building and 
and every one of them had just said lawn, 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 lawn. And just kind of half joking, I, I one day I said to, to Grant, it's kind of interesting that every plant in the landscape and all these drawings is labeled, but the lawn isn't. Um, and do you ever talk about the importance of putting the right grass on those lawns? And he says, you know, we don't. And that is important. He says, how should we solve that? And the solution was to have the design students take my turf class. So that's a real quick history of why uh, you have the turf class uh, on your concentration sheet, why you take this class. Um, and it's kind of interesting. I've got students from from design program that took this class 30 years ago, and I still see them in the industry. And, and they tell me, and you'll probably have the same thought. It's like, wow, I really wasn't looking forward to taking that class, but I'm glad I did, because at least now I can consider what to put in that lawn uh, for these these new clients and these these jobs I get. So, and uh, uh, so that just demonstrates it kind of sticks with you. Uh, you may not remember all the finer points, uh, but at least you'll know uh, number one that not all grasses are the same, and number two that you can always contact me later on in your career, and I can help you uh, with this uh, uh, this challenge of choosing the right grass for the right space. So just as um, uh, we ask questions, uh, you know, when you're doing a landscape design, for example, uh, you know, what kind of trees do you like? Do you like flowering trees? Do you like conifers? Do you like uh, deciduous trees? Do you like fall color? Uh, what kind of flower colors do you like? Um, all those kind of questions you ask when you're putting a plant in a landscape. Um, there are questions that we should ask uh, clients when we're going to put a new lawn in their home landscape or when we're trying to decide which kind of grass to plant in a new park or an athletic field. Um, and this is a not an all-encompassing list. Um, uh, some of these might be more important in certain situations than others, but uh, I would say probably the first three or four bullets in here are really, really important. And I guess I would call them common points uh, to ask when you are you know, putting a, a new lawn in when you have this opportunity to choose a grass for a situation. Um, you know, how's that turf going to be used? Is it going to get a lot of traffic from kids and dogs? Is it going to get uh, uh, soccer practice? Is it going to get 100 rounds a day in a golf course? Or is it hardly going to be walked on? Is it just purely for aesthetics? Does it just have to look pretty? Um, what is the use uh, level and the desired use for that turf? Uh, what kind of quality do you want? Some people just want to keep the mud and the dust down. Others want lawn perfection. Um, what's your willingness and ability to uh, care for that that turf? Uh, and that might be whether you get professional lawn care or you're going to do it yourself. How much time, energy, resources, water do you want to put into um, uh, maintaining that lawn or that turf, you know, that field, that golf course, whatever the situation. And then what's the availability of those resources? And that could be time, that could be water, that could be money. Um, and then as we go down the list, you know, uh, you could have, you, you, you might know, oh, I've got salty water, I've got salty soil. Um, is that a limitation? And it sure can be. Uh, maybe you're um, renovating a, an old landscape and you've got enormous shade trees. Uh, and it's a very shady lawn situation. Uh, and it's important that you put the right grass in that situation, otherwise the turf's never going to perform well. So, you know, history of pest problems, it could be elevation. You know, what we can use up in Vale and Aspen is going to be different than what you can use out in the Eastern Plains or over in Grand Junction. So, and then you consider the northern and southern parts of the United States, totally different grasses. So um, might be just can you get what you want to plant? You, know, you may read about something or hear about something and say, ooh, I want this, but I want a sod. Well, if there's no sod producer growing that grass, that can be a problem. Or on the other hand, maybe you want a seed. But if you can't get seed for it, um, 
that could be a problem. So some grasses can only be sodded, some can only be seeded. So the, the method of establishment could be a limitation. So these are all very important um, uh, uh, things to ask when you are uh, uh, starting that new lawn, starting that, uh, that, that, uh, that new soccer field or park or golf course. So as I said, we're going to be talking uh, uh, about what we call the cool season uh, turf species, and then uh, the second PowerPoint will be uh, the warm season species. So uh, uh, the cool season species, uh, the blue grasses and fescues and rye grasses, you can see them all listed there, bent grasses. Um, these are uh, grasses that do better in the what we call the cool season uh, part of the uh, United States, mainly the northern part of the United States, where we have cold winters, we have cool springs and falls, but then we may get uh, some good warmth in the summer. Now, it, now something I wanted to point out is in the uh, in this box over here, uh, uh, it says buffalo grass, and um, um, uh, buffalo grass is a warm season grass, but it's one that can do well in uh, the cool season part of the United States. So it's listed there under cool season or cool season zone grasses, uh, but it is really a warm season grass. So just wanted to point that out. Some of the characteristics of cool season species, again, they tolerate cold. They have this uh, photosynthetic pathway that's called C3. So if you remember anything from Hort 100, uh, we have different photosynthetic pathways uh, C3 and C4, and then one that we would never see in, in turf, but the, uh, the cam plants, and those would be your cactus and succulents. Uh, but the C3 plants uh, generally have very good cold hardiness. Um, um, they, they like cool weather. Um, they have better shade tolerance. Um, but on the other hand, they don't like it when it gets really hot. Um, we have this pot, uh, problem of what we call photorespiration. Um, which is uh, inefficient photosynthesis, if you will. And when you try growing these grasses too far south, uh, they don't photosynthesize at a rate high enough to maintain um, adequate energy levels in the plant. Uh, their respiration rates, the, the, the rate at which they burn energy exceeds the rate at which they produce energy. And the plants literally burn out. They, they run out of energy and they die. And it doesn't matter how good of a turf manager you are, generally it's almost impossible, especially as you get in the far southeastern part of the United States to maintain um, cool season C3 grasses throughout the summer. Doesn't matter how much money you have, how much expertise you have, um, you're not gonna have bent grass greens in Naples, Florida. You, it just can't happen. You could in the, in the winter, you could, but you can't in the summer. So the cool season grasses, the ones in the first part of this um, presentation are uh, the ones we're gonna talk about. Um, we have this zone called the transition zone. And this is um, uh, the, the zone that it exists between the, um, um, the northern cool season zone and the, and the southern warm season zone. Uh, the, the transition zone is where we might have very uh, cold winters, but we might also have very hot summers. So it can be a very difficult place sometimes for the uh, warm season uh, grasses to uh, overwinter because the winters get too severe, or it can be a really difficult time for the cool season grasses to tolerate the summers if we have particularly hot summers. Uh, so to be a turf manager in that part of the the world um, can be very challenging and it, it creates a, a relatively short list of grasses that'll perform well in a transition zone. So there's a, f a few cool season grasses like turf type tall fescue and uh, the, the Texas hybrid bluegrasses that'll do well there as far as cool season grasses. Um, but then not all the warm season grasses will perform well there because we can get winter kill if they don't have sufficient winter hardiness. So a few zoysias and Bermuda grasses and, and buffalo grass will do well there. So species selection in the transition zone is challenging 
And if anything, it's even more important that you carefully consider what grasses you plant in that transition zone of the United States. Then we have the warm season zone. Um, and this is uh, uh, where the cool season grasses tend not to do well. Uh, so we see all warm season grasses, the ones that we call the C4 grasses. So different photosynthetic pathway. Um, these grasses though, tend to be very frost sensitive um, and they, some of them may only tolerate temperatures, prolonged temperatures, you know, maybe 24 hours down to uh, uh, 30 degrees or 28 degrees and then they'll be killed. Um, other, other warm season grasses, some of them that perform well in the, in the transition zone can tolerate uh, relatively cold temperatures, but even they will reach their lower limit eventually. And so when you get down to maybe 10 degrees or five degrees above zero, uh, many of the, even the, the very cold hardy uh, warm season grasses will die. So uh, some of them only do well in the very tropical parts of Southern Texas and Southern Louisiana and Florida. Um, and if you get much frost at all, um, some of them can be uh, severely injured during the winter. So we'll talk about the warm season grasses in the next PowerPoint, but I wanted to point out the cool and warm season zones and then the transition zone of the United States. The most used cool season grass in uh, the, the cool season zone of the United States is uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Um, it's, uh, it kind of sets the benchmark for quality, uh, very fine textured and great color and density and it's soft and it's uniform. Uh, it's an easy grass to produce. Uh, for sod producers because of the uh, uh, the rhizomes. Um, so the sod holds together, it grows quickly as a sod, so it makes the sod um, uh, less expensive than other uh, uh, turf species. Very cold hardy, very uh, heat tolerant. Uh, it's got great drought resistance. Sometimes you hear that bluegrass is a, a water hog, but that's really not true. Uh, people tend to overwater it and then they get the impression it needs all that water. Um, it will go dormant and it has an excellent uh, long-term dormancy uh, mechanism. So it can go without water for a long time, but it's going to be brown, which is a protective mechanism. Uh, but it's not a perfect grass. It, it forms something called thatch, which is an organic layer that forms on the soil surface and it doesn't hold water well. And after a while, the grass starts to root in that thatch layer. So we have to manage thatch uh, in uh, bluegrass lawns. It uh, doesn't have the best shade tolerance. It uh, gets a few uh, rather severe disease problems, even here in Colorado, where we don't see much in the way of disease. Um, it's got some its share of uh, insect problems and uh, it does not tolerate salt very well. So this is one reason that a dog urine causes uh, injury on uh, bluegrass lawns uh, because dog urine is very salty. Um, and as we'll find out later, uh, rabbits, especially in the, the Western US, rabbits and uh, the rabbit urine you know, uh, causes uh, problems for our lawns here. Uh, sometimes it'll grow where you don't want it, that creeping tendency, it'll grow in your vegetable garden, your flower beds. Um, and, uh, and again, if you don't water it, it's going to turn brown, uh, but that's a protective mechanism. So it's a, it's a great grass. It's a beautiful grass, it, but it's not a perfect grass, just like there are no perfect grasses. Uh, there is a hybrid of um, Kentucky bluegrass and something called Texas bluegrass, which is a native bluegrass. Um, and breeders at Texas A&M, uh, they were the first ones to do it. They crossed Kentucky bluegrass Poa pretensis with uh, uh, Texas bluegrass, which was Poa arachnifera, and it was they, they were able to to get a, a fertile cross, and uh, it, so you this produces a grass that looks like bluegrass but has very good heat tolerance. It doesn't necessarily require less water, and that's sometimes uh, how it's promoted, including here in Colorado, much to my disdain, uh, but it does have great heat tolerance and it forms a lot of rhizomes. So it's a it's a, a good option for those hotter parts of a landscape where you still want bluegrass, but uh, the traditional bluegrasses may not do so well because of heat. Um, 
this one could be grown as sod, um, but you can also plant it as seed. So uh, a good option to have, uh, but it's uh, going to be a more expensive sod than the traditional Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, one of uh, cool season grass has become much more popular in the last 20 years. Uh, used to be considered a weed, uh, basically about uh, 35, 40 years ago, and then breeders uh, saw the some of the characteristics of this uh, quote unquote weedy tall fescue to be desirable, uh, very deep roots and good heat tolerance and drought resistance and salt tolerance and shade tolerance. So they turned this ugly weedy looking tall fescue into something you would intentionally plant. So uh, it can be a, a great alternative to Kentucky bluegrass. It, uh, it gets fewer disease problems in bluegrass. It doesn't form thatch, uh, requires less nitrogen, um, it can require uh, less irrigation if it's growing in a fairly deep soil, um, good salt tolerance, pretty good shade tolerance. So um, it was a wonder grass when it came out, um, but it's not a good sod former. Um, it uh, uh, may not mow real cleanly. It's got really tough leaves. Um, so you have to keep your mower blade sharp. Uh, when it wears out and you get open areas, it may not fill in very well. Uh, bluegrass has rhizomes that creep and fill in injured spots, whereas tall fescue, sometimes you have to reseed with it. So, so it's not a perfect grass, but it is a very, very good alternative uh, to Kentucky bluegrass, especially in places where you have had uh, um, a disease called necrotic ring spot, which is only a problem on Kentucky bluegrass. So. This is a great grass uh, to put in those lawns where you have uh, had that disease problem historically. Uh, so not a perfect grass, but it's a pretty darn good replacement for Kentucky bluegrass. And in many cases, people, they can't tell that it's tall fescue. It, the, the breeders have made tall fescue look so nice now that people think it is Kentucky bluegrass. Again, it does get very deep roots and it'll stay green for quite a while without irrigation. That gives people the impression that it has a low water use rate. Uh, but actually the opposite is true. It actually has a pretty high water use rate, higher than Kentucky bluegrasses, but bluegrass in general has a shallower root zone than the tall fescue. So you, it's not uncommon to see a lawn of bluegrass that's dormant and sometimes you have a few clumps of the weedy tall fescue growing in it and they are perfectly happy and healthy and green. Uh, thing is, is when uh, the tall fescue runs out of water, when it depletes its root zone of water, it does not go dormant very well. And so it will die when you have very long-term drought. Whereas the bluegrass just turns brown and goes dormant, then you start watering again and it comes back to life. Uh, tall fescue, won't always do that very well. In fact, it does it very poorly when we have long-term drought and watering restrictions. Fine fescues, uh, they are fescues like tall fescue, but they are very different from tall fescue. They are at the other end of the spectrum when it comes to leaf texture. They've got the finest leaves of any grass, um, very shade tolerant, um, uh, tolerate dry soils, uh, they don't need a whole lot of fertilizer. In fact, they don't do well with a lot of fertilizer. Uh, very few pest problems, uh, really a beautiful grass, but uh, they're probably not the best grass to plant in really uh, hot conditions. Um, so they're not the most heat tolerant grasses. Um, but if you don't mow them, if you let them grow unmowed, um, and people are starting to do this with, uh, they call them natural or native lawns, this is a good candidate for that. Um, downside is because they grow very slowly, they may not have, always have the best traffic tolerance. So they're not good grasses for golf course use, for example, unless you just get a very few rounds a year. So um, they're, not, they're a really bad grass to put on a soccer field or a football field. Uh, just not very traffic tolerant from that perspective. Um, and in a home lawn situation, they can get fairly thatchy, um, even in a golf course situation. So thatch management is important with the uh, fine fescues. 
There are a number of different species of fine fescue. So fine fescue in itself is not a species. It's kind of an umbrella term. Um, and these are the considered to be the five different um, uh, fine fescue species. They all look fairly similar, except the sheep's fescues are uh, kind of blue green in color, where the others tend to be a greener uh, kind of a coloration. Um, but they all they all look fairly similar. They're very hard to tell apart um, just botanically. Uh, some have more rhizomes than others, and some are more of a bunch grass. Um, but uh, we we kind of classify them all as fine fescues. Again, they're good for naturalizing lawns, lawns you don't want to mow. They don't grow real tall. Uh, the seed seed stalks, the inflorescence, get a little bit tall for the first few years after you plant it. But after a while, after they get a little sod bound, um, they will uh, really stop producing those, um, those inflorescences. And then they kind of form this nice swirly mass of grass. So it's kind of a cool look. Some people like that. Some people absolutely hate this look of fine fescue. Um, and one thing you can do is if you decide you don't like that is you can gradually cut this down to normal mowing height, and then maintain it as a lawn. Um, but it uh, it is a good grass for kind of these natural lawns and naturalized areas and maybe steep banks where you don't want to be mowing uh, very frequently. Um, so this has gained a lot of popularity in California on kind of steep, uh, uh, difficult to mow areas where you still want grass, but you don't want to mow it. Uh, the bent grasses, uh, there are a number of different bent grass species, creeping bent grass and colonial bent grass and velvet bent grass. Um, these are really for the most part, grasses for golf course situations, golf course greens, golf course fairways and tees. Uh, you'd never plant these on a uh, athletic field. Um, very uncommonly are they used in lawns, although up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, parts of uh, Washington and Oregon, uh, maybe Northern California, they'll, they'll use uh, colonial bent grass in lawns. A little bit in the far northeastern, uh, the New England states, sometimes they'll use colonial bent grass and lawns. But uh, for the most part, this is not a good lawn grass. It gets very thatchy and puffy. It actually does best if you mow it really short, uh, an inch or less, uh, which most people aren't interested in doing for their lawn. So not a great lawn grass, but great for golf greens and grass tennis courts and croquet courts and those kind of places. On the, on the other side though, um, uh, bent grass can be a, a really difficult weed problem. And so here are a couple pictures of uh, uh, where bent grass has gotten into home lawns and it forms these really unsightly patches. Um, some people, they just don't kind of notice this and others that are really picky about their lawns that they see it. Um, and uh, it's a, it can be very difficult to weed to control in a, in a home lawn situation. Not impossible. There is a herbicide uh, uh, we'll probably talk about later in, in the semester that can be used to selectively kill bent grass in a, a bluegrass or a fescue uh, lawn, but uh, it can be a, uh, a very problematic weed and it can really spread quite quickly um, and become a, a very dominant weed in a, in a lawn, especially if the lawn is shady and very well watered. Now, something that I wanna talk about uh, uh, that, that we see with the uh, cool season grasses in particular are um, mixtures of, um, of grasses. So a mixture, uh, and and I, it's good to define these two terms, blend and mixture, and they're used interchangeably, but incorrectly interchangeably. Um, they do mean very different things. A mixture is two or more different species of grass. So this could be like mixing perennial ryegrass and Kentucky bluegrass, which is a fairly common uh, seed mix, uh, especially if you go buy seed in a big box store they'll mix those two. And a lot of times they'll throw some fine fescue in as well. So you have a three-way mix of grasses. Uh, on the other hand, a blend 
as two or more cultivars of the same species. So, so this would be having two varieties of bluegrass or two varieties of tall fescue in a bag. Um, so it's the same species, but just different varieties. So uh, there are reasons for doing both of those. One is to get a little diversity in a lawn so you have fewer insect or disease problems. Um, it might be where you have a, a mixed shady and sunny lawn. Uh, you mix uh, the shady and sunny grasses together and then the shadier parts of the lawn, the, sh the, uh, the shade tolerant grass will, will do better and then the sunnier parts of the lawn, uh, the, the sun tolerant grass will do better. Um, so uh, there are very good reasons for doing mixtures and blends. Uh, if you try to mix grass species that look extremely different though, they can be pretty ugly. So uh, the picture on the right, that's a, a mix of fine fescue and tall fescue, which in my opinion is just quite ugly. Um, but it is sold to people as a diverse lawn, as a, um, and there's a company, that's, they call it Eco Lawn. Um, and I'm not sure why they came up with this idea, but uh, in the end, people usually say, what is this ugly grass? And usually it's the tall fescue growing in the fine fescue. They wanna get rid of it. So some, some mixes, work great and people don't even know there are two species or more in there and other mixtures are just terrible um, blending usually you don't see much problems with blends although sometimes you can have a really dark colored bluegrass and a really light colored bluegrass mixed together that don't don't blend well but uh, generally blends aren't as much of a problem as a bad mixture Uh, this is just a table summarizing um, uh, some of the traits of the different uh, grasses, uh, the, the different cool season grasses, their shade tolerance, their water requirement, their salinity tolerance. Um, so something I'll, that we'll be doing, um, especially on the exams, um, is we will give you a situation. We'll say we've got a customer who's got a, an old lawn in uh, Old Town, Fort Collins, it's extremely shady. Um, and the lawn that was planted, you know, 60 years ago, uh, no longer looks good. And it's because of the shade. So what advice would you give them for a replacement for that new lawn? And so you would go to this table and start looking down here and go, ooh, let's see, uh, uh, shade tolerance. And, um, um, yeah, very first row there. Kentucky bluegrass poor, not good. Tall fescue, maybe okay. Ryegrass poor, not good. Oh, fine fescues. Uh, bent grass, now I said, well, we don't want to put bent grass in a home lawn. Then al alkali grass is poor. So in this case, just based on shade tolerance alone, you, you really have two choices, the fine fescues or the tall fescues. Um, so that would be an example of how to use this chart to pick the right grass for a certain situation. And so when we give the exams, they're gonna be open book, open note. You'll be able to have this table right in front of you and you can just kind of go through it and say, ooh, yeah, this looks like the best grass for this situation. And that's, that's why I develop tables like this. And I send this table out to people and say, here, this is what you can use to find the right species uh, to put in your your new lawn or your park or your your athletic field. So uh, that was a, a relatively quick uh, presentation on the the cool season grasses, and uh, uh, there'll be another PowerPoint on the warm season grasses. As always, if there are any questions, uh, send them to me in Canvas by email or text me. There's my cell phone number right there. So. Uh, the next one will be on the warm season grasses. Thanks for listening.